So the title of this recording is NFTs and Vanessa Lau. Now, I should start by saying that Vanessa Lau is not, as far as I know, involved in NFTs, and I'm probably the first person that has ever connected the two, and I'll likely be the last. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, Vanessa Lau owns this company called Followers to Customers, and her whole ethos is essentially the idea of, I guess we could say, hustle culture. She starts all of her videos saying something like, welcome to the best place for entrepreneurs, content creators, and something else that, that's like that. Entrepreneurs, content creators, you know, social media managers, those, those kinds of words. She is a really interesting character. I watched a lot of her content because, uh, I, I, I guess I'll say, I'll start the video by not, you know, I'll start the recording, rather, by not just saying bad things about her, but maybe saying something good about her. She is very honest about who she is and what she does, and I appreciate that. She makes these videos about basically how to make money through social media, and with a very positive, upbeat, you know, uh, I would call it conservative spin. Um, in terms of whether you can succeed at social media. Obviously, her message is yes, because she is what you would call a life coach. Uh, she is unashamed and unabashed about the fact that her YouTube channel exists entirely as a revenue generation stream for herself and for her business. So, I appreciate that honesty. You know, there are a lot of YouTube channels that are very, let's say they mask how they make money. <laughs> For example, Veritasium. He uh, predominantly makes money by having companies pay him to make videos about things that they are interested in. For instance, Waymo, uh, the video he made about self-driving cars. So, she, however, has is in an industry called coaching. So, essentially, I guess this is something new, at least I had never heard of it until like five years or so ago. She, adults, hire life coaches, and she is this kind of life coach. So she will teach you, essentially, how to succeed in life. Um, you can see that uh, I'm not I'm not convinced by any of this, but she has a kind of honesty that I found fascinating. Even even though there's a lot of lies and a lot of dishonesty in the mix. Uh, for example, uh, how I became aware of her was, of, of course, I am not somebody that's on YouTube <laughs> searching for how to improve my Instagram. I don't even have one. Or how to do better in my Twitter followers. My God. The things that I post on Twitter, I will go from posting something highly technical that I know will get maybe four likes at best. I'll go from that to posting, you know, something much more popular. Um, and, and I know what I'm doing. You know, I know that when I post something about computer programming or something about type design, that that is not going to, you know, in Vanessa Lau's eyes, that is, I'm doing a disservice to myself by lowering my follower account, by posting things that people don't care about. And you know, like, destroying my personal brand. <laughs> um, uh, you, you could say that Vanessa Lau is very much kind of my opposite in, in many ways. 
I very much doubt that we have any <laughs> followers in common. Um, in fact, I I struggle a bit to find her Twitter page because she is mostly a an Instagram celebrity. How she got famous was in the year 2019, according to her. I didn't really... So, to be clear, I did not really research her story. I just kind of took it on face value. But according to her, she started her business, Followers to Customers, in 2019. And that's the year that she went from, or rather, maybe a few years prior, or, you know, in that period, rather, she had gone from zero Instagram followers to 100,000. Jackpot. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and, and does she, uh, wanted to monetize that. And she has all of these, you know, faux inspirational videos about how she had a corporate job and then she quit that. And now she's making millions of dollars coaching, quote unquote. So basically running classes, teaching people how to do what she does, I guess, you know. Uh, get rich quick, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I, 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 the video, um, or rather, yeah, the video that she posted that got my attention was why you're not growing on Instagram in 2022. Easy fixes posted five months ago. So <laughs> posted in 2021. And I did not look for this video. It came up in my recommended. I wasn't watching anything related to growing on Instagram. I don't know why the algorithm thought, you know, in its <laughs> infinite lack of wisdom that this would be interesting to me. Although, look, it was right in a way, wasn't it? So maybe, you know, it's working at like what right-wing grifters would call four-dimensional chess, right? It's, it's working at a level beyond, oh, it knows that he will be interested in it because, look, she faked the year. And he'll notice that, and then he'll make a whole video about it, and that will increase his YouTube, you know, use. I mean, maybe the algorithm is really thinking at that level. I kind of doubt it, but honestly, when AI is able to think at that level, we won't know. We will probably think it's a coincidence because we won't even be able to conceive of a mind that could come up with that kind of plan. So, you know, I don't think that the current AI we have today is capable of doing, you know, that so-called four-dimensional chess, but I'm not saying that there will never be an AI that can. But, so, this video she posted, Fix Your Account, basically, and it's got a picture of her <laughs> making a shocked face with all these floating Instagram logos in the background. And she is like putting like one finger up to her, her, her mouth. And <laughs> she looks shocked, you know, that, that, yo, oh, your account is broken? Let me, Vanessa Lau, fix it. So <laughs> the thing I found funny about this, of course, was the title. Because obviously when she posted this video, it wasn't called Why You're Not Growing on Instagram in 2022, right? It, it, it was probably just called Why You're Not Growing on Instagram. And her being like a social media marketer realized that in the algorithm, one of the most common things that people search for is the current year. Uh, whenever they're looking for something, like anything. You could even think like something obscure, like a font editor. People will type best free font editor 2021 or best free you know this 2022 and so <laughs> the thing is when you actually click the video and before you press play you can see the original thumbnail it says instagram strategy 2021 <laughs> so uh, that confirms my thought that uh, you know obviously what happened here is she is savvy enough to know <laughs> that nobody is gonna watch um well I don't want to say nobody, but she will get many more viewers if people think the video is newer than it is. And ironically, at least I find it ironic, her viewers are likely to feel 
<laughs> that the video is more relevant and not really like think hmm five months ago so that would make it quarter four of uh, 2021 right um <laughs> but actually I uh, I went to the Wayback Machine and it has a hit on this YouTube URL all the way back April 24th 2021 so this <laughs> you know five five ways to, to fix your account in 2022 uh is outdated like 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 very outdated it's it's from way last year uh in fact it, yeah it's <laughs> way outdated um and she's got uh, like a bunch of these she's also got uh another one that is yeah oh so see i was looking at the wrong one she's got so many of these on her channel yeah i'm sorry she <laughs> she's got five instagram ideas to do in 2022 get more followers reach that one was posted nine months ago and it's March 2022 even though it says Instagram strategy 2021 and then there's the other video the one that I originally saw why you're not growing on Instagram in 2022 posted August 15th 2021 okay but it marked now 2022 easy fixes to do instead uh why am I going on and on about this woman obviously I don't hate her I don't think that she is like the most evil of all of the coaches or or, or or even like particularly evil or even evil at all right i just think that she is an example of this hustle culture that we see in nfts where it's never really about the technology it's never really about what an nft is in fact <laughs> i've talked to some of the you know, people that promote NFTs because they want me to promote NFTs uh, on, on Twitter. And I know more about what an NFT is most of the time than they know, especially the history of them, which goes back much farther than they think. Um, I, I consider myself a reluctant expert on cryptocurrencies. I actually, I would say that I knew what Bitcoin was before 99% of people on Earth, maybe even 99.9%, you know, if we really, really want to get there. And, and the reason I say that is, uh, well, the things that I often point to are, I had a Mt. Gox account. In fact, I had such an early Mt. Gox account that my account was named Bitcoin. <laughs> I thought at the time that Mt. Gox accounts, this is going to be hilarious, but I thought that, you know, just like how domain names and Twitter accounts are worth money, right? If you have, like, a popular name. I thought that if I had the Mt. Gox account named Bitcoin, that that would somehow, I you know, be, be a, a, an asset that people would want, you know? People would be searching in the future for mtgox.com slash Bitcoin. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, maybe I had the hustle mindset. You see, maybe the problem is, is me, not even Vanessa Lau or anything. Uh, no, I, I, I don't really think that. But <laughs> maybe, but I, I guess I did at one time have something of a hustle mindset. Never as <laughs> brainwashed as Vanessa Lau, but, you know, uh, let's say somewhere there. So she, you know, it's not that I don't like her, but... I see in NFTs the same thing that pervades a lot of cryptocurrency discussion where it's not about what it is or how it works. And that is, see, everyone that got interested in Bitcoin in the beginning, it was very much interest in technology, programming, and computers that got people interested. I for example, like the reason that I had this Mt. Gox account was not because I thought that I'm going to make a whole bunch of money, um, you know, trading. I didn't know anything about trading. It was because I wanted to experiment with the technology. I wanted to try. Um, there was a, 
I wanted to try the first um, Bitcoin dice game because I grew up in Atlantic City, uh, which is a big gambling and casino city. And so I thought that this technology is so revolutionary that it's going to start to be introduced in the casinos. And who knows, I might be able to get a good IT job at a casino. Isn't that funny? The things that I thought in the past are, are just, you know, it's interesting how, uh, like, our plans for what we think is going to make money is never really what does, you know? Like, how we think we're going to succeed, n nothing is how we really succeed. So, <laughs> which is the problem with the Nessa Lau. <laughs> oh, God. But thinking, you know, that she can teach people to succeed even though success is extremely random and very based on circumstance. But I, I don't know, maybe that's too Marxist. Uh, certainly too Marxist for Vanessa Lau. Um, in any case, I had interest in Bitcoin because of the technology. And I wanted to play Satoshi Dice. I wanted to play um, Bit Vegas, which was a Minecraft server where you could bet actual money using Bitcoin. And I just thought that that was so cool because Bitcoin is really like, like, it didn't have very much value back then. In fact, the first Bitcoin that I bought costed eight dollars. Um, <laughs> you know, I should have probably bought more and not wasted them all on Satoshi Dice and gambling. I remember when, back in those days, you could throw whole Bitcoins down on, on Satoshi Dice like it was nothing. You know, this was really kind of back in, I wasn't as early as the Bitcoin pizza guy, but I was close. I mean, I definitely, I heard about the Bitcoin pizza when it happened, right? So I, I, I wasn't yet then really knowledgeable about what Bitcoin was or why the technology was cool. Um, cool from a mathematical perspective, right? See, you know, I feel like the type of nerd that got involved in Bitcoin in the very beginning would be a very specific type of person. It would be somebody that is very interested in the technical aspects to this. I could sit down and read, you know, the Bitcoin white paper and all of the posts explaining in great detail how a blockchain works and how the system is trustless and how we can guarantee certain things to be true as time goes on and um, block sizes, you know, uh, I, I was fascinated with strategies to decrease the block size without changing the constants of the Bitcoin software. And so, I guess why I'm talking about all of this early Bitcoin stuff is to talk about NFTs. NFTs are really from hustle culture and not from this original wave of cryptocurrency enthusiasm. And one reason I'll say that is in the beginning, one of the biggest anti-Bitcoin claims you could make is that it was non-fungible. Because that's what an NFT stands for, non-fungible token. So we <laughs> believed that Bitcoin was perfectly fungible. What does fungible mean? It means that my Bitcoin, my one Bitcoin or whatever, regardless of its transaction history, is perfectly replaceable with any other Bitcoin. And there should be no reason why you would want, like, let's say a new Bitcoin, so mine, you know, just like a few days ago versus my Bitcoin from, you know, like, I don't know, last year, two years, three years, four or five, whatever, right? So that is, um, that's the, 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 the question, is the value of Bitcoin and the value of like old versus new. And it was not guaranteed that Bitcoin would be perfectly fungible. One thing that we realized very early on was that because the blockchain is open, because there exist websites like Silk Road, because there exist hacks, it could very easily be argued that a Bitcoin's 
provenance could become tainted. So if, let's say, you have a Bitcoin and it goes through the Silk Road wallet, right? Well, it could easily be argued that that Bitcoin is no longer worth as much as the Bitcoin that is mined today, meaning that Bitcoin is non-fungible. So non-fungible token is a slur in those days to say, like Bitcoin is a non-fungible token would be uh, a troll post. You know, now, 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 now people would think, oh, so you're saying that it's worth a lot of money, but just like an NFT, it's worth millions. No, 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 no. NFT that <laughs> did not even exist as a, uh, uh, outside of very, very, you know, specific Bitcoin dog threads as a well-known acronym. Um, so that's fungibility and non-fungibility. And what that means is <laughs> non-fungible tokens have existed for as long as Bitcoin has existed because in order to make a non-fungible token, all you could say is, well, okay, any Bitcoin, pay attention, any Bitcoin with this Bitcoin address in its history is giving the person that holds it certain rights, you know, whatever enumerated rights. There you go. That's a non-fungible token. That's all it is. And I want to talk about to shift gears, but not really, because if you want to understand NFTs, you have to understand an artwork called Comedian. Now, I know that you've heard of this artwork, even if you think you have not, because really the whole world heard of this artwork during, um, I believe it was during the opening year of the pandemic, 2020. It was at an art gallery. Uh, well, it will probably just help if I describe what the artwork is. Uh, it's a banana taped to a wall there. You know what it is now? Yes. So a lot of people got very confused about what this artwork is. And even the Wikipedia article for this artwork, uh, so recently it was promoted to a good article by another editor, but I had to actually correct mistaken facts on it because people did not even understand it. Even Wikipedia editors, people that I consider, well, <laughs> this would be fun to some, but people that I consider intelligent, right? Uh, or at least maybe not intelligent, but able to understand sources and write about them in a non-biased way. It said, you know, that um, comedian is an artwork consisting of a banana taped to a wall. No. It consists of a certificate of authenticity with detailed diagrams and instructions for its proper display in an edition of three signed by the artist Mauricio Catalan. That is Comedian. Comedian is not the banana, it's not the duct tape, and it's not the wall. It's conceptual art. It is... It is the concept of a banana taped to a wall and with the writing under it, Mauricio Catalan, 2020 or 2019, whenever. It is that kind of artwork it's and, and the interesting thing is that this certificate of authenticity is not necessarily even public knowledge so like the certificate of authenticity that explains how to present comedian is not really online anywhere i looked quite hard but <laughs> that is only held like one of the three editions by the person that owns, you know, this conceptual artwork. And, okay, some people would laugh here and they would say, well, well, I can just type a banana to my wall. Okay, you can. You know, you, that would be ridiculous. But if you are an art gallery and if you want to be able to say that this is the original comedian by Maurizio Catalan, <laughs> created 2019 well you can't put his name you can't put the year all you have is a knockoff you just have a banana on a wall you don't have comedian you have you know 
comedian made in China, I guess we can say, right? So comedian is, and conceptual art in general, is the original picture of an NFT. An NFT is not about its what it is physically. It is about who issued it. But let's think of another example. Um, anybody, right, can make silver and gold coins. <laughs> and indeed, a lot of them do. Uh, and in fact, some of these gold and silver coins have Trump's image on them. However, I don't think anybody would say that a gold coin with Trump's face on it is worth as much as if it were minted by the U.S. Mint. So what is it about the U.S. Mint that adds value to the gold coin? Right? Because if you're thinking in terms of how NFTs are usually debated online, stupidly, I think, then you would just say, well, you know, I can just get uh, some gold and, and, and make, 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 make my Trump coin. But what is it about if the U.S. Mint makes the Trump coin, what gives that value? <laughs> of course, it's prestige politics. It's the same thing as comedian. And it's the same thing as Vanessa Lau, right? Uh, when it really all comes down to it. It's the hustle. It's the politics of prestige. Except now, we've gone from the hustle of Vanessa Lau to the hustle of Maurizio Catalan, the conceptual artist, to the hustle. Because Maurizio Catalan, you know, the conceptual artist, he's really kind of in the same kind of hustle culture. He is a marketer, you know? Like, everybody who was a mocking comedian was just increasing its value because they were creating controversy and they were making more people want to see the original comedian and they were even leading to speculation about what was in that certificate of authenticity, right? Which is not <laughs> available to the public. So they were increasing the value of that certificate. So um, that that is comedian, that is an NFT, and that is essentially what Vanessa Lau's coaching is because okay Lau's coaching again is not the thing itself in one of her videos she laments the fact that people are pirating her paid content so she uh obviously her whole business is getting people to sign up to her classes that she does you know you know how like <laughs> This is another humorous thing. I have been told that I could start a master class, you know? Um, master class Chan culture. Master class uh, internet history. Master class shit, even, you know, a politics of online communities. Like, just, uh, you know, all of these things that would, would attract... Uh, people to pay money, right? You know, instead of if I actually had the time to record about any of those things, I would just put them on YouTube. But, uh, she wants you to pay. And the thing about the pirated Vanessa Lau videos is that they are not the same, right? Like, the pirated, even if all the bites are the same, you are not getting the experience of being able to email Miss Lau with your questions and being able to be one of her testimonials, which, you know, that might increase at least your name recognition a little, and it will, like, you don't get any relationship with her at all. You don't get to be in her webinar. You don't get any of the benefits. So, you just get the benefit of the content, which <laughs> probably doesn't have any. Uh, okay, I mean, if you... Look, I haven't tried to grow my Instagram from zero to 100,000 followers, so how do I know that there's no benefit to her content? There might be some. Uh, if you diligently follow all of the advice and you sell out, as she has, then, then yes, I, I, I guess if all you want in this life is money, then you'll do anything for it. Probably her content can help. I mean, <laughs> as I wrote on Twitter, I have no doubt that 
her tips for quote unquote fixing your Instagram account are legitimate because she knows obviously how the algorithm works. She changed the year from 2021 to 2022. So she, she, she understands the kind of psychology and the fact that, you know, the algorithm people are searching for, you know, help my Instagram account followers went down in 2022. Help me, help me. And she knows that just those two words in 2022 will make her video appear higher. So I don't doubt that she is an expert on gaming the system and gaming people's emotions, right? Because of that, uh, gaming the algorithm. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I doubt her integrity, maybe, but I don't, I don't, I don't doubt the fundamentals. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, so to talk about more about NFTs, see, the NFT ideally, right, is not about the art. And I, I know everyone says this, let me try to explain, because it is about the art, but it's not about the art. It, it isn't about the picture, like, it isn't about the actual image that you can now claim ownership of it, depending on see it's all about the issuer and here's a perfect example of that some nfts you don't get any rights at all you can own the non-fungible token that is assigned to a certain image but you are not permitted to put that image on let's say a hat or a shirt and sell it it is still the copyright of the artist. <laughs> it's, it's, what do you own? Nothing. I, 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 I really laugh because <laughs> I wrote this article on Medium about the furry art market. And the furry art market, <laughs> it, it sounds funny even to even call it that, but that's what it is. I mean, in general economic terms, <laughs> I guess you could even say Marxist terms, right? like like marxist economic like not even not, not marxist in terms of like communist but just marxist economic you know the broad picture of history and all that it is a market it, you have buyers who are people that want to commission artwork either uh for themselves or for a friend or of this or of that and then you have vendors who are either artists themselves or agents of artists, which I'm very interested in and I write a lot about it in my article because I determined, I, when I first found this market, I was really intrigued at how many of the vendors are, are acting, on, uh, not artists themselves, but acting on behalf of an artist and how many of them had as their country of origin the bolivia the bolivarian republic of venezuela that really hooked me and I, I wanted to understand everything about how this market worked when i saw that um because I, I just was fascinated that how are venezuelans making money drawing furry art <laughs> for americans on fiverr it doesn't make sense so i uh that you know, I, I was very interested in, in, in cracking the case there. I believe I cracked it. Oh, that's not what this video is about, though. But it is in a way because this recording is about NFTs, and NFTs are often compared to free art. However, the difference is plain. In free art, that market, the entire point is the picture, right? It is having the ability to have your, whatever your idea is, put to pixels. That is the entire purpose of the market. It is not, in general, about prestige. And so, all of the cost, at least that is usually determined, is... A, if the artist wants to do it, B, material cost, and C, time cost. It, you're not, in almost all cases, although there are some that are not like this, but in almost all cases, 
you are not paying for who does it, right? Like, you aren't necessarily paying for, um, and I'm not saying that there aren't artists that charge more than others, of course there are, but you're paying for, like, a certain style and a certain, uh, final image. You're not paying to have the prestige to say, oh, well, so-and-so drew from here, or, you know, so-and-so did this, because in the market, uh, with very few exceptions, the artists are constantly changing. Um, it is not a market that people, in general, tend to stay in for years. That's why I was so interested to find that an artist I, kn I, I knew back in the day, in 2015, was still doing it. Uh, that fascinated me. Uh, and, and so that's why I contacted him. But, um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Perfectly. That we've misunderstood NFTs if we think that they are about the image. An, NM an NFT is comedian, right? It's not a piece of furry art. And if you, if you think it's the opposite, well, you don't really understand either what you've purchased or what you've seen. Uh, and I, I would say that a lot of people who have purchased NFTs don't understand what they've bought, don't understand the technology, don't understand, um, really, the fundamentals. However, I would also say that a lot of people involved in NFT discourse are being trolled. Uh, the pro-NFT side knows that just getting people talking about NFTs is good, and that's why... See, I promised I would make this recording a while ago, and, you know, don't fret and be upset with me. Y you all know how I am, and that, uh, when I started this series, I said that I will make recordings, <laughs> and I will not have a schedule, and I will post them when I feel <laughs> to post, and, uh, as my time permits, which my time is very limited, I I'm afraid. Um, especially lately, I shouldn't even be recording this, but uh, I saw Vanessa Loud today, and I felt inspired. I, I, I was thinking, how am I going to put my NFT video? Like, what's the final piece? What am I missing to make it all make sense? And, and she, there she was. So she made it make sense. Uh, yeah. That is... I think all I have to say. No, nope, there's one more thing regarding NFTs. The, the, the number of people on Twitter that are trying to get me involved, <laughs> including people I, I, I know and, and even used to know quite well. Uh, we may not have talked as much recently, but it's interesting how NFTs bring old people out of, like, old people here, meaning people I knew in the past out of the woodwork. Um, one of the things that was lamented by one of them was that I'm giving away all this money and my NFT is involved in so much charity work and nobody cares. And, well, first of all, that's a fundamental understanding of, rather, I mean, a fundamental misunderstanding of charity, a fundamental misunderstanding of philanthropy in general. I mean, that is <laughs> the most common complaint of billionaires that... You know, they do so much <laughs> good, and we get that, put that in huge quotation marks in the world. Uh, you know, through their philanthropic organizations, but that's not what journalists ask about, right? Uh, I mean, it, what am I even supposed to say to that? Okay. N nobody cares because it's run of the mill. And also, it, you see, People aren't dumb. They know that the only reason you're giving this money is to promote the NFT. So, yes, you're doing a lot of good, but, you know, not to get all, like, let's quote the Bible, right? But I do feel that, you know, there is <laughs> this quote from the Bible is kind of perfect because there there is some some wisdom in, you know, when you give... Let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And don't 
give money to stand up in the market and uh, announce it, you know? <laughs> I, you know, I can obviously not preach to anybody. Uh, <laughs> of all the sinners on the earth, probably one of the worst, but uh, I, I do think that if you're looking for what, like, the answer to why nobody cares, well, it's because societies, not only in the West, but this is a very common thing in religions, you know, not to brag about giving. Like, <laughs> it's a very common thing in, like, just human moral ethics. Uh, I just happen to, you know, know about uh, the Bible from being in foster care and from afterwards, and uh, from on again, off again Christianity. So, I am able to quote it, but I'm sure that if I was a Buddhist, I would know some sutra that said the same thing. Or if I was Muslim, I would know, oh, well, you know, it says in the Quran. I, I, I mean, I'm, this is such a universal concept that I don't understand why the Bitcoiners and the NFT guys can't understand it. You know, you don't make donations just to brag about it and hope that that will attract, you know, attention. It's, it's kind of abuse of the people that you're helping in a way. That's how it feels. You might not agree, but that's how it feels. So, yes, that is what I have to say about NFTs. Uh, as usual, this video, I'm um, recording rather, it's both really, because I make two versions, but was entirely unplanned. It, I don't know when the next one will be. I don't know what it will be about. Uh, I don't think I'm going to promise like one will be about a specific topic again, because when I do that, it, it forces me to sit and think for a long time about how to make it all work together. And I'll have all kinds of other ideas in the meantime, and I won't be able to do those because I said, oh, well, the next one is going to be about this. So I made a mistake when I said the next one will be about NFTs. I, I won't do that again. But I do like how this came out, though. And <laughs> on the very off chance that Vanessa Lau or one of her fans, subscribers, whoever sees this, or listen to this, don't reply. I don't care. I, I I don't care about, you know, how you view yourself, or if you think that you're a good hustler versus a bad hustler, or if you even think that your hustles are good for people, or that life coaching is good for people, and that everybody should have a code, and whatever. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to try to talk you out of your politics. I don't have the time. I definitely don't have the energy. Sorely lacking both. So, anywho, I will try to make these more often, but I can't promise that either. <laughs> no promises on anything. That is the motto of the Hell World Dispatch. All right, take care.